Hey there, HTVV. It's a joy to speak to you today on the second part of the sermon series, Imago Day. Last week, in part one, Mao spoke about how the Imago Day informs our identity. Who are we? The first and foremost part of who you are is that you are loved. This is the starting point of all meaning and purpose in life, that you are loved by the one who made you. And today, I want to speak to you about how the Imago Day informs our relationships. How do we live? You know, the theologian Wayne Grudem once said, the fact that man is in the image of God means that man is like God and represents God. In the same way, a picture of a person points to the person in the picture. We are image bearers of God and our lives point to something of God's nature. We are designed to reflect what God is like. We represent Him. But what does that look like? How do we image a being that we don't get to see with our physical eyes and more so the invisible God who created us? In 1977, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the US, NASA, attempted to answer a very interesting question. And the question was this, if humans could send a message to other intelligent extraterrestrial life beyond Earth about what our world is like, what images would we show them? As NASA began to send two space probes into space that year, a committee of experts came together to decide what images and sounds would represent what human life is like. These images would be encoded into golden disks called the golden records and attached to the probes cast billions of miles from Earth into space. The challenge of the committee? to select images that could tell the story of human civilization to other potential life forms in interstellar space. So what did they select? Now, what would you choose if you were on this committee? These are some of the pictures encoded in the golden records of Voyager 1 and 2. And this is the first one, a photo of the United Nations building, the Taj Mahal, a wonder of the world, traffic jams in cities, while the aliens would be able to locate KL very easily. Then came images that attempt to capture the beauty and strangeness of human beings, like this really strange picture of how humans eat food. (laughs) Or a family sitting outside their home somewhere in Africa. There were pictures of everyday moments, like a couple making art at home of people laughing at a dinner party, this might look familiar to you, of children learning in school. And then there were pictures of human goodness, of this teacher helping his students, and of this father, the love of a father for his child. Today, Voyages 1 and 2, along with these images, are the most distant human-made objects from Earth, almost 28 billion kilometers away, over 40 years from launch date. With these images is a letter that reads, this record represents our hope and determination and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. So, what images would represent your hope and determination? Now, did you know that you are on God's golden records of His handiwork. The Bible tells us that we are the images that point to something of God made in His image. Genesis 1 tells us this startling truth that when God created the universe, He made as the pinnacle of all creation, human beings. And He called us His images. In Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28, we read, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you for this amazing privilege, this wonderful truth that you have made us for yourself. Oh Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you and I are images of God. 
And this concept that God made humanity in His likeness holds so much significance for how we see ourselves, how we relate with each other, and how we relate with the world. That the Imago Dei has shaped laws, it has informed philosophy and changed human society. The ancient Latin-speaking people would later name this concept that we're made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. You and I have the Imago Dei. And having the Imago Dei informs not just who we are, but how we live. It transforms three fundamental ideas about how we relate with others. Number one, dignity. Number two, diversity. And number three, destiny. The first thing that we learn about the Imago Dei is that humans have been bestowed a special significance by God. God has given you dignity. And this is important because you can only really serve that which you value. Now, did you know that the very first words God spoke to humans were to bless them? In Genesis 1 verse 28, we read earlier, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. At the start of the creation narrative, we're told that God created time, space, and matter. And in Genesis 1 verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible, we read, in the beginning, at the dawn of time, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we're told that God created light, sky, dry land, seas, plants, trees, the sun, moon, and stars, creatures in the sea, creatures that can fly, and creatures on land. And at the end of every day of creation, we read this one line, God saw that it was good. But when He created humankind, He loved what He saw. In Genesis 1 verse 30, 31, we read these words, God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. If imitation is a form of flattery, being made in God's image is the highest form of dignity. In Psalm 8 verse 3 to 5, as David contemplates the worth bestowed on humans, he wonders out aloud, when I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, God, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. Another translation says, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crown them with glory and honor. The Imago Dei means that our dignity is derived not by relative success or favorable circumstances or good genes or family backgrounds or personal attainment, but by the value that your creator has assigned to you. And contrary to what the world may say or operate, you are not defined by what you do or what you desire. You're not defined by your duties or appetites, but by the love that is extended to you. And today you may not feel like it. Perhaps you were, you were made to feel like an accident or a burden a long time ago, but you were made on purpose for a purpose. And God deemed that that purpose was significant enough to die for. A girl once walked up to her mother and said, Mommy, I'm confused. You told me that we are made in God's image, but Daddy said that we came from monkeys. Her mother said, Well, dear, it's very simple. I told you about my set of the family and your father told you about his. <laughs> Modern culture can devalue human lives to the lowest denominators of what we do or desire. But the Imago Dei means that our lives are sacred, valued beyond measure, and worth more than our worst mistakes. The Bible says that you were bought at a great price. Jesus came into the world not just to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. In fact, the only adequate basis of the founding of basic human rights hinges on this idea that humans were made in the image of God. Take a look at Genesis 9 verse 6 as we read the establishment of this ancient pre-political law that human life is sacred. It says this in Genesis 9, Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God created mankind. And herein lies a question that changes how we relate with each other. What is the worth of a human? You know, if I see you as only what you can do, I'll use you. If I see you as only what you desire, I'll entice you. If I see you as a danger, I'll avoid you. But if I see you as valuable, I'll serve you. It was the author C.S. Lewis who said, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. 
but it is in immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Now, this does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be that kind which exists between people who have, on the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. I love that. You see, you cannot violate your neighbor's sacredness of rights and then tell him that you love God. I have the image of God in me, but more than that, the people around me have it too. And this changes not only how I see myself, but how I relate with others. It was the Apostle John who wrote, to love God and hate one's brother is impossible. I love the story of Ray and V. Donovan. In May 2001, their sons Christopher and his brother Philip were on a night out together when they were attacked by a gang of youths. Philip was beaten unconscious, and when Christopher tried to help him, he was pulled to the ground and kicked in the head repeatedly. He was then left unconscious in the middle of a four-lane road where he was hit by a car and then dragged on for 40 feet. When Ray and V were awakened at midnight by two policemen at their door, they instantly knew that something was wrong. At the hospital, the doctors broke the devastating news that Christopher had died on the operating table. And the next few years would be years of grief and sorrow. But then one day, more than 10 years later, Ray and V heard from the prison that the young man who had killed their son wanted to meet them. And there, in the meeting room, the doors were open and the young man entered full of guilt on his face. And to his surprise, Ray gave him a hug. And V said these remarkable words to him. Hey, young man, do you know what? We love you. We forgive you. Move on and have the life Chris can't have. And it was as if the weight had been taken off from his shoulders. V would later reflect on that moment. The only reason why she was able to embrace the killer of her son was because of the love of God that gave her a new perspective. And she said these words, I saw the human being, not the animal, the way Jesus sees us. You see, we are never more like God than we love others. And this is why when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, his reply was, love the Lord your God with all you have. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, if you love God with all you have, you will love what he loved with all he had, and he loved the broken world. Being made in the image of God means that you are loved beyond measure to love others beyond merit. So the first way the Imago Dei shapes us is in how we dignify others. And the second way the Imago Dei shapes us is in how we celebrate diversity. Being made in the image of God means we can love others with radical inclusion. It means we don't just tolerate those who are different from us, but rather we get to love them because love loves difference. I wonder if you've ever felt like you are on the outside trying to enter in into a particular community, not quite able to belong on the inside. In a famous lecture called The Inner Ring, C.S. Lewis made this observation that we are always at any given time located outside a form of inner ring. And he illustrates it like this. When you enter a new environment, like a school or university or a workplace, you quickly discover that there are people who already know each other. They are on the inner circle. And we all have a fundamental need to be included, to feel like we've made it. And so we want to be in that inner circle. When you were in high school, for example, it might have been a group of cool kids with cool things. And the entry requirement into that inner ring was whatever you had. In college, it might have been a certain CGPA or to be funny or smart or stylish to enter into the inner ring. Yet, what Lewis observed was that within every inner ring is a ring yet more inner. There's always another ring. And you can find yourself forever searching for that ever-elusive inner ring. And you may always feel like you are on the outside trying to get in. However, at the center of the universe, there is a true inner ring of God Himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The reason why our hearts yearn for this inner ring is because we were made for God Himself. And when you become a Christian, you're invited into this inner ring. You're welcomed into the heart of God. In the first chapter of Genesis, 
from verse 1 to 24, as God created the world, He said, let there be light, let there be sky, let the waters teem with creatures, let the birds fly above the earth. But when He created mankind, His command changed from let there be to let us make. Let us make. Here at the origin story of humanity, we see a picture of the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whose very essence is love. Long before creation was made, God existed in perfect community, unity and diversity, one God in three persons. And today, God can change the way we love others because love loves difference. To receive the love of God is to belong right where you're meant to be. You couldn't be more included if you tried harder. You couldn't be more loved if you worked harder. And from that place of security, being loved by the only one who feels the deepest longings of your hearts, you can stop striving to enter into the inner ring and you can focus outwards on including others at the margins of society. Your attention shifts from what I must do to be included to what I can do to include others. Your effort shifts from how can I be the very best to how can I raise up others to be better than me. Instead of climbing ladders to peaks of hollow success, you can build bridges for others to cross over. You can love those outside your circle and move towards them with radical inclusion. Why? Because God is love and He made you with love in mind. In John 13, verse 35, Jesus said, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You're never more like God than when you love others. You see, the foundation of the Imago Dei says we are different, but of equal value. We're distinct, but alike in our likeness of God. And because God's image is on us, we can live in a way that loves others with equal dignity. This love gives us reason to oppose racism or sexism or ageism. It gives us reason to stand against any form of alienation or othering others just because they're different. You have the Imago Dei. And this means you can value the dignity of others. You can celebrate the diversity in others. But there is a third result of having the Imago Dei, and that is to live with a sense of destiny. If God made you on purpose, He also made you for a purpose. In Genesis 1 verse 27, we read, So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Thousands of years later, in Jesus' ministry, He would one day be asked by uh, by some religious teachers a question to try to trap Him. In Mark 12, verse 14 to 17, we're told that some Pharisees and Herodians tried to catch Jesus in his words. And this is what it says. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right, this is the trap, to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Basically asking, should we pay tax or not? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. And he said to them, why are you trying to trap me? He asked, bring me a denarius, a silver small coin, and let me look at it. And they brought the coin to him. And I almost imagine Jesus holding up that coin to look at the image on the coin. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. You see, coins bear the image of the emperor, but humans bear the image of God. Here, with echoes of Genesis 1, Jesus says, give to the emperor what is his, money and taxes, but give to God what is his, our very lives. For we are his image and we belong to him and we were made for a higher purpose. You see, God made you as His image, as a sign to creation, a representation of what He's like to be His hands and His feet. And everything we do is an opportunity to reflect God's goodness and love. Your life points to God. The way you work, the way you speak with others, your walk and your talk, your play and your rest, they are signposts to a world that doesn't yet know the love of God. You see, we are like fingers that point to the point, God. But what does it mean to point to God? 
I once heard of a man who went to the hospital complaining of pain all over his body to the doctor. And so he said, doctor, doctor, everywhere I point to on my body is really painful. And the doctor said, well, point out to me where it hurts. So the man proceeded to point to his cheek. Ouch, that really hurts. The doctor said, okay, where else does it hurt? The man pointed at his shoulder. Ouch, that really hurts. And then the man pointed at his knee. Ouch, that really hurts. At which the doctor said, ah, I know what happened to you. The man said, what doctor? The doctor said, you have a broken finger. Today, you may feel like a broken finger. You may think, I don't have it quite together. In fact, I feel quite broken. And that would be true because as the story of creation unfolds, humankind would later fall to sin and walk in disobedience. So often, we're more likely to be work doers with an image to keep rather than image bearers with work to do. And the image of God bestowed on you and me would be marred by the grime of the sin and desires of the world, effaced by our turning away from God. And yet the story of the Christian faith is that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, to move towards the margin of society and to bring them in. Jesus is the one who can fulfill every need to belong, who can restore what is lost. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the perfect representation of God. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, Jesus, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The same God who spoke the universe into being, who speaks to you today with love. The God who made us in His likeness came to us in our likeness so that we could be more like Him. And to the broken, He restores their dignity. To the left out, He celebrates their diversity. To the hopeless, He gives them a destiny. In Jesus' name, Amen. So come Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill us right now. And wherever you are watching this right now, you may want to raise your hands like this. Just as an act of being open to Him, to receive from the Holy Spirit, His love and His power. And we wait on you right now as we worship you.